Thank you, Shoshana. Um, it, it is a great pleasure to give a talk being introduced by Shoshana. Um, working with her as when I was a student was incredibly exciting. And she was very generous with her time and her expertise. And I would say um, what I'm going to be presenting here today is really a direct um, connection to what Shoshana and I, as a student with many people in the University of Toronto, carried out. So I'm going to tell you about uh, ongoing work uh, at a recently formed consortium called QCRG, the QBI COVID-19 or, or coronavirus um, uh, research group. And uh, this started in a March. It initially started with 22 different laboratories um, at QBI, which as uh, Shoshana said, I'm, I'm the director of, but then it quickly expanded to over 40 different laboratories uh, encompassing essentially hundreds of different uh, uh, scientists that I argued have come together in a really unprecedented way to bring their diverse expertise together uh, to help fight this pandemic that we're all dealing with. And there's a mixture of not just systems biologists, but chemical biologists, computer scientists, structural biologists, virologists. And to me, this has been really one of the exciting aspects of, of this, of, of how different scientists have uh, ultimately come together. And I think this was pretty much the last picture I mean, sometime in March that uh, a group of us were together. We went quickly and shelter into place uh, shortly after this particular picture um, was taken. And this group got so big, we actually split it now into different subgroups focused on different technological areas as well as biological areas um, uh, as well. So there's uh, a 10 uh, different uh, subgroups um, ranging from uh, size from 15 different people up to 60 different individuals. And this is what we're all dealing with uh, is science on Zoom. It's, it's actually amazing how much one can get done on Zoom. Will be interesting to to see when the dust settles on COVID nineteen. How many of these presentations and, and meetings we'll have via Zoom? I've never given a seminar where ten minutes ago I was in bed and now I'm up uh, giving a seminar. So th this this is actually quite uh, efficient. And I have another one later today at a different part of the world. Um, so we're all dealing with the science on Zoom. And what I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, as Shoshana alluded to, is this um, paper we published about uh, two weeks ago. It's a generation of a SARS-CoV human protein-protein interaction map using technologies that Shoshana and I had uh, used uh, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and we generated this map and we used it to identify and test different drugs and compounds that could be used in a repurposing effort to help um, fight uh, COVID-19. So there's over 120 authors on here from many different countries um, around the world. And one thing I just wanted to say about QBI, about the Quantitative Biosciences Institute, um, over the last three, four years, um, we've really been about trying to break down silos and facilitate collaborations, both with labs at UCSF, across institutions around the world in a variety of different ways, and then relationships between academia and pharmaceutical companies. So I think we are in the perfect position to come together uh, and work together uh, on this uh, coronavirus in a number of different ways. And I'm just going to tell you about one particular project in that regard. So if you look at this pandemic we're in, it's, to me, it's not that big of a surprise if you think about it, because um, over the last 20 years, there's been two other coronaviruses that have proven to be quite problematic, including SARS-1 in 2002. I remember being in Toronto, Shoshana, I remember at this time in the there was a, a, a small outbreak at the Mount Sinai Hospital uh, at the University of uh, Toronto. The death rate was much higher, mortality rate of SARS-1 compared to SARS-2. Yeah. But of course, SARS-2 um, is much more infectious, which is, makes it more problematic. Then, of course, there was MERS, another coronavirus that came from camels. The death rate was even higher there, but I think it was even less infectious than SARS-1. And now we, here we are in um, you know, 2019, 2020 dealing with SARS-CoV-2. And again, the, the mortality rate is, is much lower than SARS-1 and MERS, but as I said, it's much more infectious. And um, the majority of people who get the virus are asymptomatic, which in my opinion, I guess, makes it almost impossible to contain uh, uh, the spread. And that's why it's been so incredibly problematic. But the point here is, I don't think it's that big of a surprise. And I would expect COVID-25, COVID-30, um, coming down the pike uh, over the next 10, 20 years. So we should be prepared for it, I would argue. So the approach we took here on this particular paper was trying to 
come up with, a, in some ways, a new way of doing drug development, at least for infectious diseases, by specifically targeting the host itself. And there's advantages, I would argue, uh, for targeting the host. And that's one of them is you don't have to worry so much about resistance. So there's a lot of groups out there trying to find drugs or compounds to target the virus or viral proteins, and that's great. Um, but of course, the virus mutates much more quickly than us, and therefore you do have to worry about resistance. And if you remember about HIV, the big breakthrough there was to have a cocktail of three drugs targeting three different HIV proteins. And that was the big breakthrough with respect to overcoming resistance. Well, we don't have time in this pandemic to come up with three drugs to target three different coronavirus proteins. So here we're trying to target the host. Um, we and others have shown that it's similar machinery that's being hijacked and rewired in the host during the course of infection as you go across different viruses. Not, not just coronaviruses, but many other viruses. So the idea here is if you could target the host, you could come up with a therapy or a treatment that could be pan-pathogenic. So it could work not just for COVID-19, but for COVID-24 and maybe other viruses as well. Of course, there's disadvantages in targeting the host, and one of them is toxicity. But this is why we initially targeted um, FDA-approved drugs and compounds in clinical trials that have already passed toxicity issues. So the, the hope would be that targeting these sets of drugs and compounds, toxicity would be less of an issue. So if you look at the, the SARS virus, it contains about 30 genes compared to over 20,000 genes and proteins in each one of our cells. So the virus cannot live by itself. It needs our cells, our genes, our proteins in order to live and replicate and infect our cells. So the, the vision here is, well, let's identify all the genes and proteins that the virus needs to infect our cells and let's target the set of human proteins pharmacologically using different drugs or compounds. So this is what we did, identified in the first pass over 300 uh, uh, proteins, and then narrowed that down to uh, 66 different druggable targets corresponding to 69 different drugs or compounds. And just to go into a little bit more detail into this, um, so we cloned out each one of the genes, uh, similar to what we did in yeast with Shoshana uh, 20 years ago, or maybe a little bit less. Um, put affinity tags on them, purified them from cells, and then analyzed the purified material by mass spectrometry. And um, we're using this map to make predictions about drugs and compounds, but we're also using it to fuel hypotheses with respect to biochemistry and structural analysis. There's a huge contingent in, at QBI and UCSF focused on this. Obviously, chemical biology approaches for, for uh, pharmacological intervention, bioinformatics, as well. Um, and then the idea is to merge all this information together to come up with the most important nodes or proteins or complexes or pathways that we think the virus needs to infect our cells, then perturb them either pharma pharmacologically or genetically, and then see what effects they have in infection experiments. And then in a reiterative way, the idea is that the data we get from the infection experiments can go back and reinform these other experimental uh, um, infrastructures that we ultimately have set up. So Shoshana Luta, some of our work in this regard. Uh, so after I left Toronto, we were, uh, we were doing yeast protein protein interactions. I initially focused on viruses uh, in human cells. And um, we've done a number of different viruses using this approach. Um, the first one was actually HIV, but we also have enteroviruses, Ebola. Shoshana talked about the dengue Zika study that we carried out, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. We have a big program on influenza. And normally these maps, they at least take a year, year and a half, if not longer. But in this case, we actually generated this map in a couple of weeks. And um, it was a testament, in my opinion, to the collaborative spirit that went into this particular project. Plus we had huge time constraints. The, the last sample that came off the mass spec happened the same day um, where the, the UCSF was actually shut down. So there are people now starting to trickle back to UCSF, but we got the, at least the, the data from the mass spec just before we had to shut down UCSF. And of course, we can analyze that data remotely. And we did that um, uh, with collaborators, not just in the Bay Area, but around the world. So here's a look at the, the genome itself. Um, there is some debate about the exact genes and ORFs on the virus. We tried to take a more comprehensive approach initially. We downloaded this sequence uh, January the 24th. This was from, uh, I guess, GenBank. And it was the sequence from the first individual um, who was infected in the United States in Seattle, although the virus is very similar, obviously, to what's, what's been circ circulating around the world. But we looked uh, at 16 non-structural proteins, four structural proteins in red, 
And then there's some very interesting accessory proteins, uh, nine here in, in total. There was a paper that came out of our archive a little while ago, maybe last week, that did some ribosome profiling and maybe other little ORFs that um, uh, may exist and we're looking at those in more detail. But this was our first pass. So uh, Dave Gordon, who had just finished up a project on HIV, took up this project along with Gwendolyn Jang, a technician in the lab, started this, as I said, at the end of January, uh, got each one of these genes synthesized and tagged. Here's a Western blot showing expression of all of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, or most of them anyway. And as we did, Shoshana in Toronto, what we did is uh, uh, ex express them in human cells. We started with HEC-293 cells, although we're doing a whole slew of other cell types right now. Lysed the cells, purified the proteins, uh, identified the material by mass spectrometry, and then used algorithms that we and others have developed to apply to the mass spec data set to come up with what we argued as a high confidence quantitative SARS-CoV-2 human protein protein interaction map. So I think we were the first group to clone out each one of these genes. And when we had initially submitted this paper on Bar Archive, I just tweeted out, said, if anybody wants these plasmids, I'm happy to send them out free of charge, no MTAs. There was no lawyers around anyway, so we just ignored MTAs. And we said, free to distribute as much as you want. Um, so over the couple of weeks, um, we shipped these a set of genes to over 300 labs. I think it's over 370 labs now in over 40 different countries. And I like to say that these plasmids sp spread around the world much faster than, than the virus actually did. So we were very happy that we were able to distribute these reagents to help expedite research on uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so here's the, the map that we initially had generated. It's 332 SARS-CoV human protein protein interaction map. Uh, Protein, protein interactions, as I said before, including um, a 69 uh, druggable uh, um, uh, host factors. The red diamonds are the viral proteins, the, the circle nodes are the human proteins, and if it's orange, we're arguing it's a potential drug target. We collaborated with a Hollywood lab or a Hollywood company called Zoic Labs. They help make movies, and um, they did something very cool for us in terms of making this data very interactive. Uh, so there's a, a website and a, and a database where you, if you wanted to look at the data in a very unique way, very intuitive way, I'd encourage you to go to the paper and go to this particular website. It's been uh, looked at on, by uh, 87 different countries and thousands of different people. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at this very cool interactive uh, way of looking at this information. So we've been doing a number of global analyses with this data, comparing the data to Go to PFAM, looking at tissue expression, both protein and mRNA across many different tissues in the human body, looking at different data sets in the host with res uh, respect to response to infection that have been published by us and others, and then doing comparative work across all our viral networks, our and other viral networks. So I just wanted to show you one piece of data here, which I thought was interesting. So what we did was just took the 332 proteins and looked unbiasedly across all tissues from the human body and just said, okay, where are these 332 proteins most highly expressed? And even though we did this protein-protein interaction map in kidney cells, which is HEC293 cells, the one cell type where these proteins were most highly expressed were actually in lung cells. So I thought that was very interesting. And to me, this argues that we've identified, I hope, a high quality, physiologically relevant viral human protein-protein uh, interaction data set. And we're not just generating this data to identify drug targets. We're the main, one of the main reasons we generate all these maps is to get at the underlying biological mechanism behind viral infections. And this is just one example um, involving one of the viral ORFs. It's called ORF10. There was some debate if this was actually real or not. Uh, there's the, a paper that came out last week that looked like this, this is a protein, a peptide or a protein that is indeed being expressed in infected cells. And what we found here is that it's bound, this ORF10, to a cullen-containing ubiquitin ligase complex, which is involved in ubiquitination and de degradation of a variety of different substrates. And what was great here was that we've been working on this complex and these related complexes for years, mostly in collaboration with John Gross, because this is a set of complexes that have been hijacked by HIV. And we have a, a large center grant on to study HIV human protein-protein interactions biochemically and structurally. So, uh, we were in a great position here to start to look at this, again, in collaboration with John Gross. And um, this is the adapter that we identified for Cullen 2 ubiquitin ligase complex, ZIG11B. 
and then we made predictions here about where ORF10 could be binding. I think John now will have a cryo-EM structure of this uh, very soon. And then the question is, well, what is, why is this protein hijacking uh, this column-containing the ligase complex? This is something that we're looking into very deeply. And here's just a list of other great scientists at UCSF and QBI that we're working with to dig deep mechanistically into a variety of these connections that we've uncovered um, in this particular map. So there's a large structural biology community looking into this map and studying these interactions semi-systematically or even systematically. But again, one of our um, motivations here was to look at this map and to try to identify drugs and compounds. Uh, and we identified 69, a mixture of FDA approved drugs, drugs in clinical trials, and then preclinical compounds. And here's the map arranged in a way where we've laid on top the different drugs and compounds. And I think uh, this has now become the standard of care, this remdesivir, which targets NSP12, the RNA polymerase of the virus. So the question is, can we or somebody else find other drugs that would target host proteins that could be effective as well, maybe in combination with remdesivir, maybe with some sort of cocktail approach like we've seen successfully with um, HIV. And just to zoom up on this particular drug protein-protein interaction map to show you kind of the information we're extracting. Um, and again, this was um, spearheaded by Kayvon Shokat and Brian Shoikat at UCSF. Should point out Brian's a, a Canadian as well. Uh, and these guys are two of the best uh, chemical biologists um, uh, in the world and chemoinformaticians. Uh, so for example, here with NSP13, we find it very interestingly bound to the centrosome. There's a natural product here that is known to bind to one of the components of the centrosome that we're looking at right now. We have uh, components of protein kinase A signaling. We, uh, Kayvon found a nose of a molecule that inhibits this pathway. And then we have TBK1 and TBK1 binding protein. And there's a molecule here that inhibits TBK1. So this is kind of logic that we were employing, looking at this map and making predictions um, about compounds and drugs that could come in and bind to and inhibit the human proteins and hopefully have antiviral effects. So here's a list of the drugs that we initially uh, reported uh, that came from Brian and Kayvon. And again, it's a mixture of 29 FDA approved drugs, about a dozen in clinical trial, and then preclinical molecules um, as well. And I'd like to say there's a lot of groups doing a large screens with tens of thousands of, of compounds, uh, which is great, but we wanted to take a different approach, right? We wanted to say, let's do it data-driven. Let's, let's base it on biology. Let's generate this map. And then in, instead of screening tens of thousands, let's just screen dozens and see if we can see anything. And if, you, if we do see something, then you can go back to the biology. And in terms of pharmacology, if you know what the biology is, you're so much further along in terms of being able to tweak the compound and the drug to hopefully make it more potent. So that's the logic here. So we um, put out this map on BioArchive at the end of um, March. We didn't have any uh, virological data uh, at the time. We were starting to test this, as I'll show you in just a minute. And I'd like to point out that we had no IP on this. Um, there's no patent protection, but the logic was that this information is freely available to accelerate the discovery of a, um, of a treatment. So um, I think BioArchive is great. Open source science is great, although it, is, it can be used in slightly different ways. So this was uh, a picture that Kayvon took of, uh, on, on CNN of our, our leader. We need to be careful on what information our, our leader uses here. Um, so this can be Let's just say there's in interesting consequences with respect to BioArchive that can happen um, uh, as well. But overall, I think it's very positive. So we wanted to test our predictions, our drugs and compounds in, in virology assays. Unfortunately, in the Bay Area, we didn't have the virus. We couldn't propagate it in the lab. And there's been some recent efforts to try to get that up and going, spearheaded a lot by Melanie Yon at the Gladstone Institute. I think she'll have it up and running soon. But uh, we took advantage of the collaborations that we'd established over the last uh, uh, several years, a lot of work through QBI, including a uh, relationship with the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Actually, QBI, we'd, we'd set up a, a relationship with Pasteur several years ago where we've been going back and forth with symposium and we've been raising money to facilitate collaborations between scientists at QBI and the Pasteur Institute. So we're in a perfect position to work with them. We we're actually supposed to have a symposium in Paris in March of course, we didn't do that, but we were in a great position to collaborate with them on COVID-19. And in particular, uh, Marco Vignuzzi and then Olivia Schwartz and Christoph Donfrey were fantastic to work with as well, and we're continuing to work with them. And then we also worked with one of the best virologists in the world, Adolfo Garcia Sastra. He's in the Department of Microbiology. 
at Mount Sinai Hospital um, in New York. We've worked with him for over 10 years on a variety of different viruses, and he's one of my best friends. So it's been great to work with these two groups. And the fact that we're testing in two different labs in two different continents, if we were gonna see the same thing, it would give us a lot more confidence what we were identifying was physiologically relevant. So these are just fantastic collaborators to have. Um, and we're gonna to continue to work with them for a long time. We also got support from other entities. It was actually uh, somewhat of a challenge to get some of our drugs and compounds out to Paris in the, in the middle of the pandemic. So we've actually had established a relationship with the French consulate in San Francisco. We were doing events with them actually. And uh, we, we called them up and said, could you help us get these compounds out? And the French ambassador then called the head of FedEx and there's actually a special plane that was sent uh, taking our compounds um, out to the Pasteur Institute. Uh, and I gotta, I gotta highlight this guy here, Todd, he's a FedEx guy. Uh, we actually put his name in the acknowledgement of the paper because he was great coming in every day, uh, picking up these compounds, getting them shipped out, picking up the plasmids and shipping them all, ar all around the world. So I, I got to get his last name and in the proofs of the paper, I got to put his last name in the acknowledgement. But Todd was a great uh, uh, player as well. But so we've got a lot of support from a number of different angles here to carry out this particular project. And just to go into the details of the, the vir virological assays that were carried out in New York and Paris, we um, were initially using Vero 6 cells. These are African green monkey cells. Um, when this all started, there was not, it was not clear cut what human cells to use for these virology assays. There's now a couple that are bubbling up to the top that look very promising that we're starting to use. But initially, we and many other groups just used African green monkey cells, Vero 6 cells, and we let them grow. And then two hours before infection, you add a drug or a compound, um, then you infect. Uh, there's two different MOIs that were used in New York and Paris, which in itself was interesting. Let the assay go for two days and then do formaldehyde fixation, kill, the, it kill everything. And of course, viruses are, this virus is composed of two things, protein and RNA. So in uh, New York, um, Adolfo used an antibody against one of the viral proteins, NP, as the readout, and it's a, a microscopy setup. And then looked at viral titer as well, in many cases using TCID50. In Paris, they didn't look at the protein, they looked at the RNA and did qPCR to monitor how much RNA was there in the assay uh, after addition of a drug. And they also did viral assays as well, uh, plaque assays. So it's similar assays, but different monitoring different things. And it was great to have, again, two assays in two different continents uh, um, analyzing our drugs and compounds. So we had 69 in total. Uh, at the time we um, published this, we um, in both place analyzed about 40, and in total, we looked at 47. So about two thirds of the drugs and compounds we were able to test. We've actually tested, we're in the process of testing the other 25 in, in great detail right now. We actually have some other interesting hits in there that we're following up, but I'm just gonna report on today what was in that, the, the paper. And we found that approximately about 10 to 12 agents showed uh, some potency in killing the virus. And these uh, results were consistent again in two different assays ac across two different labs and two different continents. So one group are uh, compounds and drugs that target protein translation, including zotadafin and ternatin-4. Uh, zotadafin is um, presently in a clinical trial for multiple myeloma. It's from a company called Effector uh, that was partially co-founded by, uh, co by two UCSF scientists, Davide Ruggiero and Kevon Shokat. I'll talk a little bit more in detail on that. Another compound here is ternatin-4. This also inhibits translation a different way. This is a preclinical compound, but there's another drug called uh, pladepsin. This is approved for use in Europe for multiple myeloma. It has the same mechanism of action. It hits the same translational protein. And this is actually now in a clinical trial for COVID-19. So that's one set. And then the other set, which we're very excited about, is um, modulators of these receptors, sigma R1 and sigma R2. And there's a, a list of drugs and compounds that we showed have antiviral effects, including antihistamines, antipsychotics, there's hydroxychloroquine, which I'll talk about later, uh, female hormone progesterone, anti-anxiety medication, and then some preclinical compounds. And the point I wanna make here at this, at this time is that if you just looked at the chemical structures of all of these compounds, there's no way you could say they're related whatsoever. But if you knew what the target was, and, and this is what we think we do know, these, these receptors, they're very related. And, and correspondingly, they all have antiviral effects. And this is a great example of if you know the biology, you're so much further along with respect to the chemistry and the pharmacology. 
Um, so to go into a little bit more detail first in the translational inhibitors, here's the map. And we found a number of connections to translation here with different proteins. Uh, this one in particular, NSP9 with EIF4H, it's a translational protein. And EIF4H actually regulates another translational protein called EIF4A. And Zopatafin from the company Effector actually binds to and, and inhibits EIF4A. So that was our link to that particular uh, compound. And here's some uh, data, some antiviral assays, which I'll go through with you briefly. Um, I'll just highlight here the New York, uh, the assays from New York looking at ternatinin, which actually hits another translational protein, EIF1A, and then Zotatafin. So uh, what we're doing here along the x-axis is increasing the amount of drug that we have. In black, we're looking at cell viability. In red, it's looking at the virus using the antibody against NP. So what you'd want here is a black line across the top and then a red line going down as fast as possible. So there's some interesting antiviral activity with respect to both ternatinin-4 and uh, zotatafin. Interestingly, both of them are being used for multiple myeloma. Um, uh, an equivalent to, to um, ternatinin-4, as I said, is in clinical trial right now for COVID-19. And we're working with the company Effector. This is gonna go into a clinical trial very soon here in the United States. So just looking at where does zotatafin and ternatinin-4 work? So as I said, zotatafin actually uh, targets um, uh, EIF-4A, which is itself targeted by EI4H, which came out of our map. This is translational initiation. And then ternatinin-4 hits EIF1A. And this is through translational uh, elongation. And this other drug, pledepsin, which looks very promising, that's been in clinical trial right now, hits the exact um, uh, same protein. So we have two different points here along the translational pipeline uh, uh, that we can pharmacologically inhibit that look quite promising in terms of antiviral effects, which were extracted from the protein-protein interaction map. Now to the second uh, subgroup of proteins, the sigma R1 and R2. So sigma R1 binds to NSP6, and sigma R2 actually binds to another putative coronavirus protein, um, ORF9C. Uh, and these are very interesting receptors in that they've been studied for a, a long period of time, uh, but they'd still be classified as orphan receptors because we don't know what the natural molecules in our cells that actually bind and regulate these. But there's this whole slew of drugs and compounds that are known to bind to these receptors and pharmacologically manipulate them. And here's, a, again, a list of these drugs and compounds with respect to their antiviral activity. So we have antihistamines, antipsychotic here, the haloperidol, the anti-malarial drug, hydroxychloroquine, um, this uh, hormone, progesterone, ceramycin, this is an anti-anxiety medication, and then some preclinical compounds. So the fact that we knew the target, we could identify all these, and we showed that they all have antiviral activity. Ryan Shoiket has identified several more in this category that have even better um, antiviral activity, and we're trying to narrow on which one will be most exciting in terms of trying to push now uh, into uh, the clinical setting with, with one or two of these. So we have a couple even more exciting ones that are known to regulate sigma R1 and R2. And just to tell you a little bit more about sigma R1, which is more characterized than sigma R2, um, it actually is at the cell surface, you know, like ACE2, like the canonical receptor for the virus, but it's also intracellular at a couple of different organelles, and in particular at the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's been connected to a, a wide array of different biological processes, but many people still consider it uh, very uncharacterized. Um, so we're looking very deep at this. Uh, in a variety of different ways, including with Andy Kroos at Harvard University, who's worked on the crystal structure of this receptor. Now we're working with him on trying to get the structure with ORF, the ORF from uh, the coronavirus, plus and minus all these different compounds. So it's a, a huge amount of work that we're doing right now. And one of the preclinical compounds here is called uh, PB28. And here we're doing a TCID50 assay with New York. And just to show you here, um, PB28, although it's preclinical, is actually 20 times more potent um, than hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I know hydroxychloroquine is an FDA-approved drug, PB28 isn't, but this is a molecule that we're looking at very deeply right now, we're very excited about. We're actually getting it into an animal model, into a hamster model. That's what's being used for uh, coronavirus. Uh, and Kayvon Shokat and other chemists are tweaking this and trying to get this more potent uh, with respect to binding to the receptor and hopefully having antiviral uh, uh, activity. And it's also important to point, 
correlated with the more potency here with respect to killing the virus, it has a much greater affinity as well for sigma R1 and R2 versus hydroxy uh, chloroquine. And this was work here done in collaboration with Brian Roth at the University of North Carolina, one of the world's experts on studying these uh, uh, receptors. And um, since we couldn't do genetic experiments initially, we, do, we now can do genetic experiments to confirm sigma R1 and R2 are actually the right receptors. What we had to do is try to pharmacologically narrow down on what we thought the receptors were that were being hit or which proteins. Um, so here are the different categories that we looked at and pretty much the only receptors that were known to hit all these different drugs were sigma R1 and R2, which gives us a lot of confidence. We're looking at the right proteins. Plus they were on our protein-protein interaction map. And um, one of the problems with hydroxychloroquine is actually, it's been in clinical trials, but it's associated with cardiotoxicity. There was a big trial in Brazil that had to be stopped. The main reason was cardiotoxicity. And what I'm showing you here, and uh, this is data from Brian Roth, is that hydroxychloroquine actually binds more tightly to HERD, which is the receptor on the heart, um, when compared to sigma R1 and R2, compared to PB28, or other drugs or compounds in this category, including clemestine. Okay, so the argument here is that um, clemestine or some of these other drugs will not have the cardiotoxicity as hydroxychloroquine if introduced into humans. It could have other toxicity, but at least we don't think, based on this binding in vitro molecular data, that these other compounds uh, will not have uh, the cardiotoxicity that's uh, shown with um, hydroxychloroquine. So just as an example, you can see um, PB28 here. This is the blue line binding to HERD, and it's much more potent here binding to sigma R1 and sigma R2 compared to hydroxychloroquine, which is here. All right, so we're trying to providing some in vitro data, which we think uh, supports this notion of why hydroxychloroquine is uh, more toxic, is specifically cardiotoxicity. And this is an interesting experiment that was done by Chris White in Adolfo's lab. So if you remember on the assay, we're adding the drug, waiting a couple hours, then infecting. Um, but what about if you infected first and then added the drug? So he did this, which I thought was a great experiment, which actually tells us a lot, um, where he added drug pre and post infection. So we're looking similar to what we did before, is adding the drug um, two hours before infection. Here we're adding it, the, infect, the, the virus and the drug at the same time. And then here we're infecting for two hours and four hours and then adding the drug. And it's important to, to note here, we're adding 20 times more virus. So the MOI is, is much, much higher. And you can see the antiviral effects with all of these drugs are similar if we added the drug before infection or after infection. So this says a number of things, including this supports the notion that um, these drugs are not having an effect on entry, it's post-entry, and that's consistent with our protein-protein interaction data, which is essentially generated from within the cell. So I thought this was a, a, a nice experiment here. So just to go deeper into some of these observations, I think we identified two major pathways here, a translational pathway and another pathway involved in these sigma receptors. Um, I'm excited about exploring combinatorial approaches with these compounds and drugs. And just like we saw with HIV, maybe you'd have to take one of these drugs and compounds and combine it with remdesivir, for example. So these are ongoing experiments as well, doing all these different combinatorials, not just with drugs we've identified, but other drugs that are being reported as well. So just like genetic interactions that we did in yeast, Shoshana, for many years, it's, the logic is the same as doing combinations of drugs and perturbing multiple pathways at once. It's the same logic. Everything comes back to, to yeast and how you think about it, at least in, in, in my mind. So um, one interesting phenomena that we identified and reported is actually one of these drugs actually appeared to be proviral. And so all of the, the drugs and compounds that I alluded to with respect to the sigma receptors were all classified as antagonists in that they bind to the receptors and turn down the function. And, and, and in correlation with that, we see antiviral effects. Well, Brian Schreikat called me up one morning and said, look, if we can if we turn down the function with an antagonist and you get antiviral effects, if you add an agonist, which turns up the function, you could potentially see proviral effects. And he said, well, dextromethorphan is, is an agonist for these receptors. And sure enough, we saw when we added this, almost as an order of magnitude there at the end, at the highest concentration, we see proviral effects, which in our mind was very exciting because it helped narrow down on these receptors. Because if you have can pharmacologically turn something down and you see a phenotype, if you turn it up and you see the opposite, that gives you more confidence you're looking at the right protein. Although uh, as an aside, which was kind of an ironic thing, dextromethorphan is actually in almost all cough suppressants, which is obviously 
potentially connected to COVID-19. So we reported this as, as a, a finding that we've uh, uncovered in the laboratory. We have no idea if this is translated into humans, but we just wanted to report this in a responsible way and, and just say um, you know, more tests are needed, but this is what we see in the laboratory setting. But again, for me, it was a confirmation that it was so important to be looking at these sigma R1 and sigma R2 um, receptors. Okay, and some other data that we're putting together right now, I just want to talk about at a high level. Um, so I talked about protein-protein interaction mapping. We're now doing systematic genetics on all those interactions using CRISPR and RNAi, which is very exciting. But at a proteomic level, we're also globally looking at phosphorylation. And this was in collaboration with our uh, scientists in Paris. We're working a lot with Pedro Beltreo, an ex-postdoc of mine that's now at EBI, EMBL. He's one of the world's experts at computationally looking at post-translational modifications. Um, and so we infected Bureau 6 cells and then in a temporal way looked at phosphorylation changes. We enriched for phosphorylated peptides using uh, titanium dioxide. And the idea was we'd want to find kinases that are up or down regulated that we could pharmacologically inhibit as well. So this is what we argue is the first dynamical map of SARS-CoV fossil regulation during infection. Pedro did this clustering and we identified five different clusters that we think are very interesting, either increasing or decreasing or going up and down related to different biological processes. But what we really want to do is to take that data and then map back to kinases that are being either up or down regulated. And uh, there's a couple here at the top that we're now showing pharmacologically, pharmacologically we can inhibit and have an effect on the virus, including casein kinase too, interestingly, this is a kinase that we found in our protein-protein interaction map, um, physically associated with N. We're looking at this one deeply. We're very excited about this P38 map kinase pathway. And then you have certain kinases that are downregulated, like CDK1, um, which is quite interesting um, uh, as well. And then if you start to overlay the um, phosphorylation changes on our protein-protein interaction map, you see a statistically significant increase of the proteins in our map being differentially phosphorylated, either hyper or hypophosphorylated in the course of infection. And this is uh, some of the data just being laid on top of our protein-protein interaction uh, a map, which, which we're very excited about going digging deep into. And then we actually found a number of the viral proteins themselves being phosphorylated, including M. There's a number of serines here that seemingly are very hyperphosphorylated or phosphorylated in infection. Um, an N protein, it's scattered all over. And then the NSP14, there's just one site that's very highly phosphorylated. So there's a lot of biology I think we can extract from this. And I should also say we just, as of two days ago, uh, obtained data, our global ubiquitination data by mass spec as well. So that's looking very cool, especially when we can, can combine it with the phosphorylation data because there's a lot of crosstalk between ubiquitination and phosphorylation. And as I said, with respect to this phosphorylation data with Kayvon Shrokat, we made some really cool predictions about which kinases are important, we're pharmacologically inhibiting them. Uh, inhibiting them. Kayvon Shoka is the best in the world at, at doing that, and we're working closely with our collaborators in New York and Paris on that front. So just to summarize, I mean, um, I talked about you know, the work at QBI connected with Mount Sinai and the Pasteur. There's many more groups involved in this particular project, scientists in um, England, in Michigan, in Seattle, in San Diego, in, in North Carolina, connections with a, a wide variety of different companies as well. That's been very exciting of how we've been be able to interface with a number of companies, not just here in the Bay Area, but, but around the world. So that's been very exciting. And um, I just wanna end with this idea that, you know, I, one thing I always, I don't like about science, I've never liked it, is that it really is siloed, if you think about it. And the system is set up in many ways to reward the individual and not a group of scientists working together. One person gets tenure, one person gets a grant, one person gets an award, uh, an award. And this setup, I would argue, discourages often young scientists from collaborating with larger groups because tenure comes up and say, oh, what did you actually do on this? Why are there so many authors on there, your paper? And I hate that. You know, I actually think that's a good thing if you can collaborate and there's lots of authors on paper. That shows you can actually collaborate with other people at the end of the day. So for me, what's been exciting about this obviously this huge tragedy is the realization how fast we can all move when we actually work together. When silos are broken down across different laboratories, across different institutions, and then across academia and pharmaceutical companies. So what I'd love to see is this infrastructure that's been set up around the world. Um, you know, we're, we're involved in one, there's lots of other projects like this. Let's keep this in place. 
you know? So if you think about how fast we move, we had the virus in January, at least in our project, you know, we cloned out the genes, we generated the map, we made, got virological assays set up, tested these, and now we're talking about getting some of these into people in a matter of three months. Why can't we do that normally? And, and if we have this infrastructure set up, we'd be more prepared for COVID-22 and COVID-24. And when the death settles here on COVID-19, I want to go back to the lab and work on breast cancer, and Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's uh, uh, like this. And I hope that this type of infrastructure stays in place. And to me, this has been a real silver lining of this whole tragedy. It's, it's shown us, it's forced us to work together and shown us how fast we can move when we actually do work together. So um, this is, uh, I think I've acknowledged most of the people along the way that have worked on this. This is my group. And the person that spearheaded this was David Gordon. He's a postdoc. He's now been transitioned to a research associate and a technician who's been doing all our maps for years, all our viral maps. She's a hero here, Gwendolyn Zhang. And then with respect to our mass spectrometry setup in the lab, it's being run by Daniel Swanee, Ruth Huttenhain, and uh, Robin Cake, among others. Uh, and if, there's, if you wanna find out more information about our work with respect to COVID-19 or other projects, I'd encourage you to go to our website and I'd be happy to take any questions right now. Well, thank you so much, Nevin, for this uh, uh, presentation and for the message for continuing the collaborations and for breaking down the safe silos. It has been something that I was also fighting for I think all my career, but you, yes. you have been more successful than I have been. <laughs> We've talked about this many years ago, Shoshana. We've been talking yes, about this yes, for years. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so here are a number of questions. We don't have too many, but we have a few. So I will uh, present them to you. So one is from Dr. Uh, Prashant Singh. And he says the NCOV-19 shares almost 97% homology with SARS. And this creates cross-reactivity. How to overcome this? So, <laughs> I mean, ahead. I guess how to, how to overcome this with respect to a developing therapeutic I'm not sure what you meant, but you know, try, try to. <laughs> well, try I, to. Don't, I mean, it, one thing I will say, uh, as of last night, we've actually cloned out all the SARS-1 genes yeah. and the MERS genes. So we're going to be generating protein-protein interaction maps on SARS-1 and MERS for, for ultimate um, uh, uh, comparative studies. But I see the fact that SARS-1 and SARS-2 are similar as a potential good thing in terms of if you come up with a strategy, especially targeting the host, or maybe a vaccine, if it's that similar, um, that it could have cross-reactivity um, uh, you know, for not just these coronaviruses, but other coronaviruses in the future. But on our end, we're doing detailed molecular studies, SARS-1, uh, SARS-2, MERS, actually working with Harmeet Malik in Seattle, who's an expert on zoonosis, and he's made another prediction about some other virus presently in bats that he thinks could be another danger of jumping. So we're studying that with him as well. So we're generating this data to try to get a better understanding of uh, how um, these viruses jump. And then when treatments do come available, maybe we could be useful in terms of predicting not only what those treatments are, but how wide ranging they are as they go across different coronaviruses. Okay, thank you. So there is now another question. Do the virus proteins interact with each other or only with host proteins? Motivation, do virus virus interactions need to be accounted for? Which is a question that I already asked you by email. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we initially, as a baseline, just individually express the proteins to do this protein-protein interaction work. However, there's known complexes in these viral proteins, right? There's um, the polymerase, uh, there's a methyl transferase. So what we're going back now to do is co-expressing uh, the, the complexes where one of the components tagged and the two others, if it's a three protein complex, are not, so that we can purify um, the complexes, the viral complexes, and see if, those, if, if there's additional interactions that are seen or more relevant interactions that are seen when you have the known, all the known componentry of the viral complexes there. So that's a great question. And we're going and doing that actually right now with the known complexes. Great, that would be very informative. Now, uh, Dr. Parash, uh, uh, Prashant Singh asks another question, which he says, which, which programs do you use for host pathogen interactions? Um, so we study a variety of different viruses. I showed a slide where we look across many. Uh, we also do a lot of bacterial species. And you know, we also have large mapping initiatives on different disease areas like cancer, 
and neuropsychiatric disorders. And maybe this answers your question, maybe it doesn't, but we actually see a great overlap between these maps that are focused on viruses and other disease areas that are seemingly unrelated, like cancer and neurodegenerative disease. And to me, it doesn't, it's not that big of a surprise. You know, we see the same genes mutated in cancer that are hijacked by different viruses. So, or we see, you know, the, the proteins, Shoshana talked about Zika virus that are hijacked by Zika being mutated in neurodegenerative disease. And again, it's not that big of a surprise. You have these Achilles heels of the cell, they become mutated and result in disease X, Y, or Z, or viruses evolve to attack these. And um, to me, it's not that big of a surprise. And it comes back down to these silos. Why don't we see this? Is because scientists in different disease areas don't talk to one another that much. But these type of data sets allow to make connections, not just between genes and proteins, but between different people working in different disease areas. And I think that's the kind of the underlying motivation between drug repurposing. I think that's why a lot of anti-cancer drugs are starting to have, be shown to have antiviral effects because the underlying biology is very similar. Okay, now we have another question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Singh as well. Do you have any genetic data for these interactions? Yes, so we have knocked these all out by RNAi, all 332 and A549 cells expressing ACE2 and see some really great confirmation of these PPIs. We've, in a, with a company in South San Francisco, have knocked them all out with CRISPR too. And we're screening these in New York and Paris. Um, so we're, we're very excited about, you know, mm -hmm. getting this information out as fast as possible. And we're, we're doing genome-wide CRISPR screens as well. But we're initially focusing on our proteomics because we think that's highly enriched for being physiologically relevant, as we've shown in the past. And we're doing targeted genetic studies on the PPIs and finding very interesting biology there, as we've done with other viruses in the past. Now, a few, a few more questions. One, two questions by Terry Gasterland. And she, she asks, so would people be taking, should people be taking hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, to prevent infection? Yeah, I saw the... I yeah, answer it, this more or less, but I, anyway. I saw Donald Trump announcing he was <laughs> taking this yesterday. I, I just, I don't think there's enough data to support, that, unless he has information that the rest of us don't. Um, there's ongoing clinical trials with hydroxychloroquine. There's a lot of toxicity. Right. I, I don't think the information is strong enough for taking hydroxychloroquine, but there's a lot of clinical trials going on. So maybe maybe it's a certain point of infection where it's actually going to become useful. But you mm -hmm. know, just as Tony Fauci keeps saying, you need more data and more clinical information to make these type of claims. And we just don't have it yet, uh, in my opinion. But you, you did confirm that it, it, it acts on, on it, it, it diminishes a, a viral infection to some extent. It but does. It is the main problem. And we think it's going through Sigma R1 and genetic experiments that we have published mm -hmm. really support that. So we think we understand why, mm -hmm. but then we're digging deep into the toxicity associated with it and with heart right. disease. With, with, yeah. uh, so, and we think it's binding really tightly to the Herg receptor of the heart. So we're going deep into that. That's really interesting. So now another question by Terry is, can bioinformatics help zero in on the best drugs to be part of a preventive cocktail? And of course, that's I think Shoshana would say absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I always think of these in terms of genetic interactions. That's how I always thought about this, right? Yeah. Pathways, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, if you, I mean, if you think about the cocktail for HIV, it's really three pathways because it's targeting I don't know, like, what is it? Uh, the protease, integrase, reverse transcriptase, or, you know, it's, it's three different drugs targeting three different proteins. You can think of them as three different pathways, right? Yeah. So the more information we know about the pathways, not just the individual proteins that the viral hijacks, but the pathways, the more powerful we can be with respect to being predictive of what pharmacological intervention would be most effective. But what you need is a map of the healthy cell without respect to all the pathways, right? Yes. That's how you can interpret mutations associated with disease or the viral proteins, what they're coming in doing. So it's, you, in my mind, you really need this healthy reference map in order to more accurately interpret mm -hmm. disease. And then you can be so much more powerful in terms of predicting pharmacological cocktails. And that's, that brings me to the, to the next question, which is specifically about how, how the mutations in the host proteins will affect viral infection, viral interactions. Yeah, and I think so what's so interesting about this virus, as we all know, is that it affects people so differently, you know, and, and um, you know, obviously there's correlations with um, age and comorbidity, mm -hmm. but there's also cases where there's 30 year olds that are, some are asymptomatic and some are on ventilators immediately. And th they, look, they look very similar. 
So I think what we need, and this is what's ongoing, is uh, sequencing studies to find variants to help explain these different categories. I'm a big believer that genetics contributes to everything to some level. Yeah. So if we could find different variants that are associated with outcomes, the, the idea then is well, we could go back at a molecular level and understand what those, if they're encoding regions, what those specific mutations or variants are doing at a molecular level uh, to try to understand the underlying biology behind why one person is asymptomatic and another one isn't. And, and, and it becomes very problematic with somebody else. And then hopefully it can point to therapeutic directions as well. This is something we're exactly doing with HIV. We have this group of HIV resistant people and we've identified variants in them that we're characterizing in vitro, looking at the protein-protein interactions that we think help explain the, why certain people are resistant to HIV. So more, the more information that comes out on the genomic data, the more you can go in this direction. And that's an area I'm incredibly excited about. And Nevin, do you know of any efforts right now to uh, systematically uh, sequence genomes of, of patients that uh, are positive or, or have been sick with COVID-19? Yeah, so that, group, that can be done, you know, down the road? There's a group at Stanford. I've heard of several of these. And Washington, D.C. is trying to coordinate an effort along these lines, trying to get different groups together. Um, so mm -hmm. it's going to, it's happening. And the challenge is how to coordinate all this yeah. and get all the information together <laughs> in, in a digestible way so that, you know, computational scientists like you, Shoshana, can look at it and make, you know, make predictions. But yeah. Yeah, there are many, 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 many strategic uh, problems that, that need to be solved first. <laughs> what, but it's, it's, to me, it's yeah. reassuring. You know, if this would have come in the 1980s, we wouldn't have had the tools. But look at all the yeah. technologies now we have that are made to communicate. So yeah. I'm hopeful that, you know, all these people working together, we're going to come up with something useful with all this data soon. A few more questions, if you, if you bear with us. So Melina uh, uh, Baikus uh, asks, do you think chemostat mesylate has the potential to be included in a combination therapy as it aims to inhibit viral entry? I, I think... Someone from Imperial College asking the question. I think it's a great idea. I, I, we haven't worked on this. I haven't looked into this deeply, but I just think in general, a common, common notorial approach, hitting some host, hitting some viral, I think that's just like we saw with HIV. I think that's going to be the, the breakthrough. And I hope this this camostat is hopefully one of these that uh, could be useful in a combinatorial approach. Now we have another question that uh, uh, by uh, Wayne Hayes. He asks, would the yeast to hybrid provide more precise interaction maps? Mm -hmm. Well, well, I could, you know, we could talk <laughs> about this for some time. I, so the what we're doing here with respect to these kind of pairwise interaction studies is initially characterizing the complexes by mass spec and then going doing more targeted um, pairwise studies to get a better idea of the interfaces between the proteins. So we're collaborating with a group in um, Australia right now that's just taking all of our interactions and going and doing and looking at you know, pairwise type mm -hmm. of analysis. I know others are doing genome-wide um, two hybrid screens. That'll be great to integrate in. I mean, I think in the past it's shown that two hybrid data provides different but complementary information to data derived from APMS. But what we're doing with respect to two hybrid and kind of related pairwise approaches is focusing on our set first and then and going deep and then working with people like Andre Shally, who can take this information and then come up with models, structural models of, of complexes. And then, of course, you can do make specific mutations and make disruptions and combining that type of data with cross-linking mass spec, which is what we're also doing, gives us a better idea of the topology of the complexes we've isolated. So it's very complementary and we are using it in a slightly different way than maybe was proposed by Wayne. Thank you. So uh, another question by Kunai Kundu. Uh, if new strains that are coming up for the virus, do you think that the interaction map would change? Yeah, it's a great question. There was one particular variant that received a lot of press was uh, a mutation, I guess, in the S protein. And it was hypothesized that this particular strain was much more virulent and causing much more trouble. I don't think that's been proven yet. It's an interesting, it was based on modeling. It's an interesting hypothesis. We're actually looking at that particular mutation, seeing if it has any effect on our map. But yes, in general, as this virus mutates, as you get different uh, um, variants introduced, we can go back to our map and see what these different mutations are doing to the interaction. So you can look at, um, we talked about looking at people. We can look at variants, you know, the sequence from people. That's one axis. And the other axis is looking at variants and mutations in the virus. So 
as this virus chains, we're in a perfect position at a molecular level to try to understand what these mutations are doing with respect to complexes and protein-protein interactions, hopefully. Now, uh, I think we're getting to the end, more or less of the question, two more. So uh, one is by Maurizio, what other disease treatments have been developed using the same approach, meaning studying the PPIs between host proteins and existing drugs? You know, it's a great question. And you know, before this, you know, I thought, okay, what we've been doing with our maps, with our protein-protein interaction map, generating the maps, then doing the genetics, doing structural biology, right? And my, my thought was, okay, you needed to generate the protein-protein interaction data, you have to validate it with genetics, you have to get the structure, and then you'd, that would lead you to more intelligent targeted drug design. This is the first time that I've ever, I mean, it's partially due to the, 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 yeah. the sense of urgency, was to go from protein-protein interactions right to pharmacological inhibition because we didn't have a genetic system. We, 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 you know, so we had to try something. So in this way, it's actually doubly good. It validates the map that you generate, but then if it, it actually points you in a potential therapeutic direction. So I'm looking back on all these maps, I'm thinking, why the hell weren't we doing this before? You know, I was thinking, you know, proteomics, genetic structure, then go to, to potential pharmacological intervention. Now it's right up at the beginning. So any map, Shoshana, any map that we generate now, in a disease state, yeah. I'm going to be talking to Brian and Kayvon and say, look, give me the drugs and let's see uh, what effects these have in this particular readout. So I'm a little embarrassed. Especially, yeah. Especially when you start from, this from before, but now we are going to be doing this. Great. Now, one more question, I think, one or two. Yeah, something like that. They're coming up. So, you know, people are really excited. So uh, uh, what was it here? Yes. Is it possible for the virus to be integrating genome, integrating the genome by interacting with each other or a single, if a single person is infected by more than one strain of the virus, something like that? I think that's very unlikely. I mean, yeah, recombination with different viruses. Yeah. I think that is, that's a very unlikely scenario. Um, I guess in vitro, in a test tube, you can probably get that to happen, but in a human body, I think that's unlikely, but that's not my area of expertise to talk about. But for Ebola, you know, if you get several infections, one after the next, or, or one after the other, then you have, you have a, it's, it's very dangerous, no? What, what does that mean? Or, or dengue. If you get dengue, infected with dengue, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, second yeah. infection, you're actually a dengue, lot worse yeah. than the first one. And I don't, that I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, and that's a very interesting question. And it'll be, I hope that's not the case with this coronavirus. I don't think it is. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> I don't think that's from recombination of viruses within the body. I think that's a different phenomenon and having to do with like how our immune system reacts to infection. But, um, you know, more data is needed to look at that. Uh, there is a question by uh, Thomas Lazar. I'd be interested uh, how many of the drug hits you found in your studies for repurposing have known binding sites on the protein receptor. So how many of the drugs that, that you know, have known binding sites that that you can you know you can home in to study so with so when we, i mean uh, um so with our group we looked at about 40 something and um you know four of them were predicted to hit these sigma r1 sigma r2 then the fact that we got a hit there with those four that allows us to augment our search space which is mm -hmm. what we're doing which is what we did and what we're doing right now so if this is a great example of knowing the the target then you can start are the, to are, are the are the sites are the binding sites known for these targets that's what yes, he's asking these ones yes and we also have allosteric inhibitors of these receptors yeah. as well pams uh positive allosteric modulators that we're looking at mm -hmm. as well that also turns up the function of yeah. the receptor but interestingly when you go and there's a number of these large-scale drug studies that are being done um and identifying compounds so brian's looking at these in great detail and he's saying look a lot of the drugs that are being reported for for COVID-19 are actually could be explained by binding to these receptors. And we're, and we're testing a lot of these in vitro um, as well. So I, I, I really believe that these receptors, these Sigma R1, R2 receptors are gonna be just as important as ACE2 uh, with respect to the virus. So, and, and the great thing is that they're very pharmacologically manipulatable. So I, I hope, you know, I hope something can be found in this area. This is why we're, we're putting a lot of our effort. So I think that's one a last question from you know from the participants by Swati. 
is there currently some database or platform where patient clinical data obtained by you or otherwise can be assessed and used for analysis publicly or yeah i mean i think you're alluding to kind of retrospective analysis and there's yeah. you know all these clinical records and um we're it's actually a, after we published our paper a group reached out to us and they said they saw some core actually a couple groups mm -hmm. but one in california they saw some correlations in people based on some of our in vitro um uh results so that's the goal then is to look at medical records do a retrospective analysis and say all right if if somebody's on uh, you know this particular drug are they less inclined to get infected so to right. me that's a very exciting angle and i'm glad you brought that right. up swati uh that's something we're looking at right now so i have two questions one is you know what is the link with the tuberculosis network what would be the link there that's kind of intriguing there have been some reports on 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 some links with bcg you know vaccination or something like that yeah i mean it's um we haven't gone too deep into that i mean for me it's like okay both of these pathogens uh, affect the lung right so that's yeah. okay one area although obviously the coronavirus is seemingly infecting a lot of other things affecting other right. things but I, think, I still think the lung is the major um problematic area um, and as you say interestingly the bcg vaccines is being reported as maybe having providing some immunity against the covid 19 i don't i don't know the latest on that with respect to the data but it's i agree it's very interesting shoshana and uh for me it's you know the lung and we're looking you know, we're starting to look across these different networks um from these other pathogens to see if we can have get some information glean some information about covid 19. now the the last question my my other question is there were some reports, intriguing reports, about a heartburn medication, which is called famotidine, that actually was given to poorer people in China, <laughs> and you know, and 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 those you know fared much better. Do you know anything about that? I do, and it was a, a clinical trial that's ongoing right now in the United States. Yeah. There was a, an, uh, it was written up in Science. It wasn't a, a paper in Science. There was a news piece in Science that yes. came out a couple of weeks ago. And they claim that this compound, which is in Pepsid, um, actually binds to the protease of the coronavirus by by modeling. But I think people have thought that no, that's it's not that's not if it yeah, has yeah. any effect, that's not the buffing like protease. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's so it looked very intriguing. I remember when that came out, I was like, well, maybe we should go buy a bunch of Pepsid, Pepsid A. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the other one doesn't work. The one that's that's prescribed for the for the rich people. I know. I no, know. it doesn't work. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Uh, but it's this thing in Pepsi Day, and, and uh, yeah. uh, I thought about going out and buying a bunch of that stuff. But you know, it's it was one. It, there's an ongoing trial right now, so we'll. I'm you know, hopefully there's something positive with that particular drug. But its mode of action is not known. Not we actually known. thought potentially that that could be binding sigma R one. Okay. And and we tested that in vitro. It wasn't. And in, in vitro assays, that particular drug has no antiviral effects. That's not to say it doesn't in humans. I mean, you don't see a perfect correlation. But you could look for, for similarity with other drugs that you have looked at, that you have identified. Maybe that can, can give you an idea. We're looking at that right now. Actually, Brian is looking closely at that particular drug in a number of different ways. Well, thank you very much. That was very exciting, especially your worldwide collaborations and, and the idea to continue this effort, you know, that science will change thanks to this horrible uh, pandemic. And I hope many other things will change as well, not only science, but you know, let's, let's continue to be positive about it. Well, and thanks for everybody to listen and, and, and to ask all these Thank great you. questions. And Shoshana, you, when I come see you, you owe me a beer. That's the deal, okay? More than that, I promised you a nice meal. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to seeing you soon, Shoshana. Yeah, 